Hi again, Mark here from Talking Bass. Today, we're going to look at that old chestnut, Mustang Sally. Yep, pretty much every bass player gets to play this one at some point. If you play bars or any kind of function or wedding gigs, this one is going to come up and with good reason. It's a soul classic, everyone knows it, and they can all join in on that annoying chorus. <laughs> Now, when you learn this, you're likely to learn one of two versions. There's obviously the original Wilson Pickett classic, or some people use the cover version from the film The Commitments. Today, we're looking at the Wilson Pickett original and the bass line played by studio legend Tommy Cogbill. So, like I said, many of you probably already know this bass line. It follows a 1-4-5 blues progression in C, and I've seen that starting riff played a ton of different ways. The most popular way is like this. So we've got that root note C, then that little half step F sharp leading into the G, the fifth, then coming back up through the B flat, the flat seven. You might also see it with a repeat on that opening C. I've also seen it played with an F in place of the F sharp. And I've seen it played with an A in place of the B flat. Now, all of these different riffs will work, and let's face it, nobody in the audience will know or care which one you're playing. As long as you've got those offbeat eighth notes in there and something vaguely close, they're usually going to be too hammered by this point of the night to even care. <laughs> But because this is talking bass and we're, you know, talking about bass, let's have a look at what Tommy Cogbill really played and why pretty much everyone gets it wrong. And with good reason. Some of these old recordings can be fairly hard to transcribe from a bass perspective. With Mustang Sally, the general mix combined with Tommy's thudding flat wound tone means there's no real bass clarity when hidden beneath the guitar part. But I recently discovered a great website in the shape of lalal.ai. It's an artificial intelligence based stem generation tool for extracting instruments from a recording. Now, as you might be aware, there have been a multitude of different tools and plugins over the years for isolating instruments in a recording, but this one is online and you can upload and generate previews of the extracted instruments for free. If you want to download complete strong extractions, then you pay a fairly low fee for a set amount of minutes. And I have to say, the quality of the generated stems I've created so far is very, very good. So, as you can imagine, I tested the service out with good old Mustang Sally, and what I found in the bass part shocked me to the core. Let's slow that down a little and listen again. So what we have there as the main riff is this. So for that bass line, we're starting on a B. Yes, it's a C7 chord, but we're starting on the B there, on beat one. So we've got B to C. So that's second fret to third fret on the A string. Then we drop down for the F sharp up to the G. So that's what I played in the, uh, you know, in the very popular transcription there. So that's second fret to third fret on the E string. So, and then we have the A there, the open A string on the off beat leading us back into the start of the riff. So, so after hearing that preview, I isolated the whole track and quickly wrote out a transcription of the first chorus. The sheet music tab and drum tracks are all there over at Talking Bass, so just follow the link in the info below if you want to play along. So the bass line with the drums sounds like this, and we've got four bars to start.
So we have our basic C7 riff played four times for the intro. Okay, then we have it another eight times when the vocals enter, and on that eighth bar, we lead up into the F7 chord with this line. Okay, so we've got the starting B to the C, then we come up, C sharp, D, E to the F. Okay, so that's after the second fret, third fret on the B to the C, we come up fourth fret, fifth fret on the A string, then the second fret, the E on the D string, leading into the F at the third fret. Next, we've got an F7 chord for four bars where we pretty much take that riff and we just take it up onto the next string up. Okay, so that's all written there. But on the first time, we have this little variation. Okay, so we've got the F played twice there, the third fret of the D string. Then we've got A, B, C. So that's open string, second, third fret on the A string. Then same again on the D string. Open D, E, F, open string, second fret, third fret. So. And then we're just into that main riff again. So. Okay, so once we get up to the F. And then on the final of those four bars, we have F to the E flat, third fret to first fret on the uh, D string. So. Then we're back into the C7 riff four times. Then instead of the open A string, we hit the open D string to lead us into the G. Then we shift that riff up to the G7, so. So we've got the F sharp into the G this time, fourth fret to the fifth fret on the D string. And C sharp into the D, fourth fret to fifth fret on the A string. Then we can play the open D string again to lead us back in. Same again, and then we have G, G flat, F, fifth, fourth, and third frets on the D string to lead us into that break on the F sharp. So, oh, sorry, on the F7. So, so we've got those two tacit bars, tacit meaning we don't play anything, while the singer harps on about, you know, weeping eyes, and then we get this funky little fill leading us back into the C7 riff. So we've got. So we've got F to G, third to fifth fret on the D string, hammer on. So we plug the first note and then hammer on. Then we play the B flat at the third fret of the G string. Then we have F down to the E flat, third fret to first fret on the D string. Next, we're back into four bars of the C7 riff before the next chorus comes in and Round and round we go until the audience are flat on the faces drunk, unable to sing about riding or Sally anymore. Mission accomplished. So you want to put all of those riffs together along with the variations and the fill, practicing it slowly away from tracks or clicks or anything like that. Then you can try playing along to the drum track over at Talking Bass. I've got two tracks, one slow at 100 beats per minute and the other at the original tempo of 110 beats per minute. You can try out the slow version over there if you want and I'm just gonna demonstrate with the original tempo. So here it is at 110 beats per minute.
to finish up, let's just look at a couple of things worth considering here. First of all, it's worth mentioning the tone. I'm using a Fender Precision kitted out with flat wound strings for that traditional dead tone. I've purposely avoided using any muting for this lesson just so you can hear exactly what notes I'm playing. But if you want to be a little more authentic, you can always use muting to deaden the sound. I tend to use my trusty Nordy mute, but you can just as easily use a piece of foam pushed under the strings. You can use palm muting in the picking hand or maybe palm muting in the fretting hand. Whatever way you do it, that's going to give you more of an authentic 60s soul vibe. Then it's also worth looking at the theory behind what's going on here. So why does this bass line work? Well, if we look at the chord for the first riff, C7, we've got the notes C, E, G, and B flat. The first note in the riff is B natural, okay? That's got nothing to do with C7, and it's actually a really dissonant note right there in between the root C and the flat seven of the chord, which is the B flat. So why does it work? Well, that's because it's only being used in passing or as an approach. Yes, that B is right there smack bang on beat one, so it's actually an accented approach note. But the way to look at this is very much like the riffs that you find in punk and funk styles. So I'm sure you've heard riffs that sound like this. That's exactly the same move as Mustang Sally. We have the B leading into the C right there on the beat. And you might have also seen funk chord lines that sound like this. You know, when you get that on beat one. Again, that's a half step lead into the root chord right there on beat one. After that weird approach into the root, we've got another half step approach into the fifth of a chord. So it's the F sharp to the G. And this is exactly the same principle. It's a chromatic approach note into a chord tone. It has a certain jazzy, funky vibe to it, and it's worth remembering this for any time that you want to create your own bass lines. Yes, you want to work around the chord tones, but don't feel too caught up in scales. Chromatic approach like this can work really well even in the most basic of settings. As long as you're resolving that tension, you can get away with some really out there chromatics. Then for the A in there, that major sixth, that's simply a passing note between the fifth and the seventh. We're just rising up in a scale of fashion into that weird seventh move. So it's between the G and the B. And that sixth there is really, uh, well, it's fairly pronounced, which is great in this setting because soul tunes use the sixth degree quite a lot in bass lines. So you'll get lines like this. Or... Now that, that major six, that pentatonic vibe, you get that a lot in soul tunes. So that's Mustang Sally. Like I said, it's pretty surprising what you can uncover when you isolate some of these more buried in the mix bass lines. And in this case, it's really hard to hear that B to C move because of the very dead muted sound of the bass. That half step move is not that obvious. So remember to like this vid, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. Then just hit the link in the info below to visit Talking Bass where you'll find all the lesson material for this and over 500 other free bass lessons. Also sign up to the free membership to gain access to a huge number of free bass practice resources and downloads as well as the forums, groups and other social areas that make Talking Bass an amazing all-round bass education site. Okay, I'll see you next week.